is when the Vols have the ball. You see, just quick stats here. Tennessee number one in the nation in scoring offense. Clemson number 20 in, in scoring defense. Tennessee's rush offense, 18th. Clemson's rush defense, 10th. So good matchup there. If you're looking for a difference, Tennessee's pass offense, third in the nation. Clemson's defense, 70th in the nation. Uh, of course, all these stats can be thrown out because half the guys who made those stats happen have opted out. <laughs> but we wanted to show it to you. We're giving you information here on the Sports <laughs> Source. All right. I am joined uh, over at our bistro table here by Justin Hamilton, and uh, I want to break down Clemson's defense. And uh, we talked earlier that uh, they are kind of a mimicking game plan kind of a defense. So if we assume they took a look at Georgia, because nobody gave fits to Tennessee like Georgia did, if we assume they look at Georgia, remind folks what Georgia did against Tennessee. So the first thing Georgia did was they took their mathematical advantage. You can see their three defenders to Tennessee's two receivers on either side of the formation, which then leaves in the interior of the, the box five defenders. Tennessee's got to, in my opinion, be able to run the ball. With that box, you have five blockers for five defenders. You have a running back, and I think, too, you need to design some quarterback runs as well in that. Uh, that's where your mathematical advantage is. That's what Georgia wanted. That's what they gave Tennessee. Tennessee did not take advantage of it. On the outside now, Georgia, with their coverage, they played the deep routes with these corners. They start tight. They're going to play deep. The safeties are going to play deep. They're not going to give you the vertical throws that have killed everybody to that point during the season. Which Joe Milton is... He loves throwing them. And so. he's got the, the cannon to yeah. do that. So, and, and then with the overhang defender here, in most defenses, this defender is your balancer. He's your extra defender in the run game. He's your extra defender in the passing game. Georgia extended that defender way out. No, I was just going to say, to remind folks, Hypo's system really tries to stress you here. Absolutely. There's such a huge split, you're supposed to not know what to do with this guy. He doesn't know where. And Georgia just went ahead and said, oh, no, we're pushing him out here. If you want to run it, run it. Absolutely. And, and Tennessee really didn't. Uh, correct. And if Clemson doesn't have the opt-outs inside, they have similar personnel up front to what Georgia has. But now this defender, if they use Georgia's game plan, he's going to extend out. He's going to be a disruptor on the inside most receiver, whether he aligns there or, in this case, switches. So now with two deep defenders, the overhang defender extended, what, in my opinion, Tennessee needs to be able to take advantage of are the two areas here in the short passing game, short of these DBs, the corner and the safety, and this defender can only be in one of those windows. So you've got a two-for-one option here where you're going to have to catch the ball. You might not get the big play, but you get the catch, you get some run after the catch, you get a one-on-one -on -one tackle, and those are ways that I think Tennessee can really hurt that type of defensive plan. The problem is they're daring Tennessee to be patient. It's not a patient offense. Uh, we learned last year during the bowl game that when they got to seven or eight plays, they would say, take a deep shot. Our offensive line's getting tired. Uh, I didn't hear that this year, so maybe it was a little bit better. But when you look at being patient, you know, they're daring you run the football. They're daring you take the short throws. Again, I don't know that Joe, Bazooka Joe Milton <laughs> – is going to be a guy who will be patient. I don't know that, the, you know, Alice Golish isn't here, so Josh Heupel's probably going to be calling the plays again. Will he be patient? Uh, you're saying clearly that's the plan they need to be patient, but the question is, would they be patient? And I think that's the cat and mouse game that you're always playing as a coach. You want to force a team to do what they're not comfortable doing or what they've shown that they just won't do. If they do that, Clemson, in my opinion, doesn't have the talent tackling-wise that Georgia had. That's what I was going to ask you. So those short throws can turn into big plays. You get the completion. Your quarterback's not taking hits. Guys get the ball in their hands. You get the one-on-one -on -one matchup, but it's make you miss rather than beat you over the top. You mentioned more design runs with Joe Milton, and I'm not so sure. We've talked about it on the show. I'm not so sure that he's a guy who likes to run as much as a Hendon Hooker, for example. But Tennessee didn't run Hooker much against Georgia. Makes sense. You still had four more games to go, and he was taking a lot of shots in that game anyway. It's a bowl game. Uh, it's expected that Taven Jackson will be back as your backup quarterback if something happened to Joe Milton. Do you, if you are the offensive coordinator, if you're the head coach at Tennessee, are you saying, last game, Joe, run it? Are you designing runs for him? I'm designing runs. I'm going to call those design runs early to show the other team we're willing to do this because that's going to affect them between series and how they adjust and how they're playing you. And then you see going into your next series or your second, third, fourth 
series, how they adjust, and you may create some one-on-one -on -one matchups that you didn't have otherwise. Excellent, excellent. Anything else you want to add about their defense uh, and Tennessee's offense? They offensively and defensively are going to steal your signals. That's going to <laughs> happen. This so is you, interesting. You brought this up the other day when we were chatting about this. Yeah, okay. There's a reason why you see 15 people on the sidelines with curtains and with signs and boards because they're going to try to figure out if they can get a beat on what you're signaling in it's very peculiar how they seem to have the right call on both sides of the ball in those situations. As someone who's coached against them, you've noticed that, well, you know, everyone does it, right, to some yes, extent? Yes, But they do it well. They are exceptional at it.